Mm-hmm. I would like first to thank the three different presenters uh, that have made the tower of uh, question or different issues. Regarding uh, energy, uh, climate and water, that are three sectors that um, are inter- interrelated. Um, I would like, um, I have some comment that can in certain way sound like question to the different presenter. My first one is, um, Doug mentioned that um, uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, the effort of different countries to develop the renewable energy is more and more important. Take example of, uh, took example of uh, South Arabia that um, is, show his willingness to uh, its willing, willingness to um, to develop its renewable energy uh, sector um, the world energy outlook that have of 2040 that have just launched uh, a state that um, the amount of subsidies of uh, south uh, arabia um, keep them to uh, to prevent them to develop the renewable energy sector <laughs> and uh, pull, pull them back by about uh, 30 years. Um, so my question is, do you really think that the different commitments that have been made until now and the different commitment that will be uh, made in the, uh, Paris in November will really help to change things regarding the importance of cold, oil, and gas industry. Cold and gas, um, as cold, gas, and oil has been estimated to be um, in quarter, quarter, quarter uh, with uh, renewable energy by 2040. Still 2040. Uh, my second remark is on energy subsidies uh, of United Nations, uh, of uh, United States. Um, energy subsidies and uh, particular fossil fuel subsidies are still important. And the United States are one of the biggest uh, subsidies in, um, in, in the fossil fuel area. What sort of political incentive can be implemented to, to help to reduce those uh, subsidies in that the uh, international organization such as IMF or World Bank uh, stress developing country to reduce uh, their uh, fossil fuel subsidies why in developed country like United States or in China uh, fossil fuel subsidies keep growing thank you yeah sure I, I have two questions um, uh, let me start with, with Doug. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's great to hear that the cost of solar and, and uh, other renewable options are coming down quite rapidly. When I think about um, some of the concerns that we might have in places like remote rural Africa, and you mentioned rural villages a few times, um, it is, of course, the cost of installation, but we're also worried about things like the cost of maintenance and ongoing ongoing costs. And I don't know if there's any remote, remote USA is not remote Africa, but do we have any evidence um, on how the maintenance cost might be higher in rural parts of the US? And then can we extrapolate from that um, just what the, uh, uh, what, the, what, what the maintenance cost component will be for, for sort of transforming rural Africa and getting solar and mini grids in, into some of the most difficult places to reach. And then for, for Jake, I was thinking about, you talked a lot about finance, and I think it's certainly to my, in, in my mind, or in my view, a lot of the emphasis from developing countries has been on adaptation funds, getting access to these adaptation funds. And one of the things we were discussing while I was at WIDA was this possibility that actually, um, if by some miracle there was some co- uh, global price on carbon, and, um, and if, uh, if uh, developing countries, say Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, were able to get their, their, um, their, their money back because they are under-emitting relative to the global average, I mean, simply put, if there's a billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa excluding South Africa, and if their, their gap between them and the average is about three or four tons per person, then um, even if the price of carbon was at about $10 per ton, you're talking about 30 to 40 or 20 to 30 a billion US dollars per year. And so that might go a long way towards closing some of the, the gaps, the investment costs that might be needed to, to transform Africa's energy future. Um, and so maybe my maths and my thinking are totally naive, 
but, um, but does this suggest that we should be trying to really push developing countries in which we work to be far more aggressive on the mitigation side and to maybe even volunteer themselves to participate in a, in a carbon pricing system? I'll leave it at that. Let's take two questions from the crowd and then answer the set of four. Do we have a, a question? Let's go on the back. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the great presentation, which is here. All three presentation was really great. Um, all three issues is um, uh, linked to the Central Asia. I'm from Uzbekistan. My name is Malika, Dr. Malika Said Khajaeva, and um, I am from EAE, International Association for Energy Economists, and uh, from Uzbekistan. And uh, um, we uh, face the same issues: is we built uh, roads, interconnection roads increase the trade for development the region. Uh, we try to develop the, um, the, the renewable energy for producing the, but uh, they also the face the issue, trans uh, the water issue, water energy nexus issue. And uh, I'm happy to hear that it's solar uh, price, uh, the, the solar energy price go down. And this is can be can be the the key to reduce the construction of the hydro um, energy um, um, facilities for the from the Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. I mean, stream countries which is blocked the water supply for the downstream countries like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, but uh, I'm sure that it's, uh, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the development of roads and uh, Could you, to the get to the question please. the question <laughs> is uh, the question is is the 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 the, the question is is the technologies the technologies reconstruction the roads and construction the other the the the, the um, energy like the, the new solar energy technologies could be solution to, to not increase the um, the develop uh, the construction the um, the the, um, the I mean the standard um, generation capacity like uh, the the coal or the, um, 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 the the gas or some other but use the some other uh, renewable energy like solar or biomass or some other technologies which can be applied without increasing the um, uh, the influence to, to the, the nature. Something which is not bring to big influence to, to the nature. Okay. But and not stop the development. And, and we have another question here. Thanks. Um, True Shedvim from CEDA, the Swedish Development Cooperation Agency. Uh, thanks for excellent uh, presentations. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, it, there seems to be a general kind of uh, uh, view that the decline in the oil prices are not temporary, but are, are therefore a bit of a, a longer term, and and that this could be kind of the chance to to change um, the whole structure of the energy subsidies. Um, how do you view that? To Nadia's question, basically, that what potential do you see in this and what could support uh, a process uh, towards redu uh, in uh, using the margin that is now created by the reduced oil price to actually reform the fossil fuel uh, subsidies? Thanks. Let's, um, let's go. Let's start with Doug. Um, thanks. So I got a, a, a couple of those. Um, let me uh, let me be brief about that uh, responding. So, in the INDCs in Paris, to the first part of the question, um, there are actually a number of renewable energy targets uh, um, contributed by those countries which have contributed their INDCs. So, we will see that um, actually the IEAs come out with a pretty decent report most recently on their analysis of what those look like. Uh, and whether or not it's, it's a bit like uh, what Jake showed is that it's um, a good step, necessary but not sufficient uh, in terms of really uh, achieving the, the, the total um, uh, carbon uh, peaking and or carbon goals that you have to go forward with. But there will be promotion, I put it that in quotes there, 
of additional renewables uh, there. Um, to the subsidy question, I'll add mine, and uh, other people can uh, can certainly come back onto that front. Um, you know, the G20 made a commitment to um, quote unquote uh, e eliminate uh, or levelize subsidies, uh, particularly around fossil fuels uh, and around all energy. A couple of years ago, um, we've seen very very little action on that front, and so I don't hold a lot of uh, hope that there will be uh, some kind of international accord uh, to really move that forward. But what I do see, and I think that your, your question actually around, is this the right opportunity given a drop in fossil fuel prices, um, uh, uh, opportune time. And in fact, Indonesia um, actually recently announced uh, the, the elimination of, or the, the plan to eliminate their internal fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, in the last few months. Uh, so I think you're going to see an indication of that. There's also discussion in China right now of power <laughs> sector reform at this point in time when power uh, demand is lower, et cetera. And so you're going to see that move forward as well. That's got less to do with oil, but it's got more to do with, with demand uh, uh, softening as well. So I think on that front, it's actually quite, quite interesting. And whether or not there's a, a collective mechanism or there are going to be independent mechanisms, I think, is going to be uh, yet to be seen. Uh, let me just do, very quickly do the, on the remote maintenance side, particularly for, I'll call it, rural power systems in Africa. And I think that the, the general trend, that, at least that I'm seeing, is that innovative small companies are including uh, cell phone-enabled uh, transmission systems so that they, they actually understand the health of those systems at headquarters, if I can use that term, via cell phone communications. And they know when a system is either being abused or misused or is out of service. And most of the time what they're doing is they're actually taking what I call a services model. So rather than selling product to you, they're actually selling services. That you're buying X number of hours of, of light or hours of charging your phone. And it's really to their advantage to know the health of the system and then to include this maintenance piece in the overall packaging and the pricing so that, frankly, it's, a, it's an employment, it's a capacity building opportunity, and it's part of the affordability of the whole system when you include the innovation on the finance side as well. So I think that the paradigm that, that was 15 or 20 years ago where you sold a system to a, to a rural villager and you had to train them on it and then you had to provide maintenance maybe, uh, if you were interested in it, is really uh, now um, actually um, out of date. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing a lot of innovation come forward in, in terms of providing services to people at affordable rates. So, Sorry. Good. Um, good. Great. Uh, just a couple of thoughts, I, I think, on on Nadia's question. I mean, do, I, do, we, do I think that out of Paris we're actually going to get anything to happen? <laughs> And the answer is yes. Yes. Uh, my, my point is we're, we're, we're going to get a lot. We don't get as much as we need, but we shouldn't be depressed about the fact that we're, that, that, that we're not getting all we need. We, we need to focus on, on getting more. One of the, uh, so I, I think the fact that the, the fact that for various foreign policy reasons, not necessarily related to climate, the, the, the U.S. and China found it in their interest to get together and make some kind of a joint statement. I think that was politically very important for, for both countries. Europe has been out in front for a long time on this issue. So this has created some, some momentum that I think is, is, is quite important. It, it's important to follow through with, 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 with systems that can, that can support those, those commitments. But I, but I think, it's, yes, we're going to see a lot. And the thing that I always want to remember when I, when, when I make speeches where I say we're not getting enough is to point out that almost everything we can do, anything we can do, has its biggest effect on the upper tail of the risk because the nature of the climate risk is a big upper tail and the biggest effects on the upper tail. So I think we, are, we shouldn't be too depressed. We have to push for more, but I think we should not be too, 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 too depressed about, it, about that. So I, I think that what's happening is, is quite good, and I think more realistic than the Kyoto uh, approach. Uh, on the question of finance, a, a, a great question. I didn't. I forgot a comment I was going to make when I when I gave my three my three points at the end. This is a group. Of, this is a group of people who, who do economics, 
And of course, economists keep pushing, pushing, pushing for markets, for the use of markets. And indeed, when in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the commitment to uh, mobilize the, the, the $100 billion, uh, the, the, a lot of the developing countries have said, we want that to be government direct aid we want and, and and some of the developing countries particularly the united states says no 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 that's not what we have in mind what we have in mind in a trading system in, in, a, in, a, in a trading system there would be flows of funds that could be tapped exactly in the way it was being suggested to to, to uh uh to to provide to provide finance in a trading system and and so i think that uh that I think we will ultimately come to those trading systems uh, in an attempt in an attempt to lower the cost of of achieving these these reductions, but it's not going to. We're not. Gonna, I don't think we're going to see that in the near term, except in particularly uh, in, in particular circumstances. See a few of them, but not globally. And I I I I, I think the the most likely outcome in the in the development of these systems is not going to come uh, with a lot of the developing countries in some in some. A global trading system that's just too complicated and requires too much institutional development. What may happen is uh, what is now popular in the economics literature: the notion of the development of, of a club, a club of, of of probably countries, developed countries that already have developed market institutions, uh, the U.S., the Europe, perhaps some of the some developing countries like 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 China, and uh, uh, and, and and others. Would develop maybe four or five countries would develop a club and 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 develop this institution, which would then spread to other countries when they had the capability to do it. So, I, as an economist, you have to say yes, that's where we want to go, and I think we ultimately are likely to get there out of the attempt to control cost. But on the horizon that I was talking about, like 15 or 20, 25 years, I think it's very hard to it's going to be very hard to develop the institutions to do that. But certainly, from the standpoint of a de of what what I, what I would perceive to be in the interest of a lot of developing countries is to push for that because that's 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 the financial flow that a lot of people have in mind that might might be tapped for the for the for the, for the 100 billion exactly in the way that was discussed let's do um, let's do one more question and then I'll we head for lunch go ahead Anand. hi i think it's a small enough room Thank you very much. I think there were very interesting presentations covering a wide range of issues. I'm sure that we'll be telling the organizers that a couple of words were missing in the title, that is climate change and energy and development, I think, because definitely there were issues related to that. Just two questions or two comments which I would invite panelists to uh, come on and, and uh, comment about. One is um, the $100 billion question. Um, it looks like a big number, but I have done estimates on the resource rents. Um, approximately, it could be about 1.26 trillion per, per annum resource, natural resource rents globally. Uh, about 70-75% of that coming mainly from oil and gas. So I think the way we frame this 100 billion thing and connect the whole debate about renewable energy with the kind of, uh, um, if you like, the nature of markets or existing incentives for certain kinds of forms of energy, I think that connect is, 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 a, is a major challenge. I think the resources are there if we can find it. The only way is uh, how we can connect those. That is one. And second, I think the transboundary issues um, related to, again, a, a great presentation from um, Korea. Um, I think building trust between nations becomes a very important issue in transboundary river management, as Aaron Wolf and colleagues show in case of Senegal River Basin and various others. So I was just wondering, in case of uh, Nile Basin Initiative, uh, you mentioned about it in, the, in your last slide, but if you can say a little bit more about how you can um, build more trust in terms of sharing information and knowledge. Thank you. So, um, uh, responses quickly, and we'll get people to lunch. Yes. <laughs> basically, um, hello, yeah, basically you gave the answer. Um, you build trust at the f in the first place through transparent information. Um, in the Nile Basin Initiative, uh, we have tried to, to have a information sharing agreement between the countries. 
and um, and we try to demonstrate through these kind of exercises, through uh, uh, independent modeling and getting the information from anywhere we can get, uh, sharing it to everybody and showing that there is no secret behind it is the first step towards that. And um, it is, I mean, things have changed in the last four decades. 40 years ago, uh, Ethiopians and Egyptians would not sit in the same room and talk about the Nile. Um, but now that information is available, um, at least at the technical level, at the director level, and partly also at the politicians level, they're sitting at the, in the same room, at the same table, and, and uh, discussing on the basis of the same facts. Because even a decade ago, I know that there were meetings where um, there was the a debate, is it uh, 49.1 billion meter cubes or is it 47? And then the meeting was dismissed. So these times have changed and it may take another decade to then transform this trans transparent information into trust. Basically, that's what I can say. Jake, do you want to, or? Well, <laughs> one, one person's resource rent is somebody else's income is the problem. <laughs> so, you know, there is this, there is this flow, but I don't, I don't see a way to, 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 to tap that flow. I think that we will tr will try to get what we can get out of out of government commitments of direct aid. The total that's the total that's around now is around 10 billion out of Europe and a little bit out of the U.S. and such. It's very, it, it, and I think that's going to be hard to get that very 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 much greater. But then the, the the question is, well, when they talk about mobilize, they're talking about a total movement of of, of resources. So the question is, how can we create how can, we, how can we conditions that lead to private private investment? It's going to have to come out of the private sector. So we're back to the larger discussions here about about markets and 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 and, uh, and the uh, investment investment conditions. I, I just raise two puzzles, which I don't know the answer to. But but when they talk about the hundred billion, as someone has already mentioned, the, the basic idea that about half of that was for mitigation and half for adaptation, and and how to think clearly about what it means to be giving aid for adaptation and how would you know what to do and how would you know what the needs were for adaptation. Uh, th that's something that's going on in the negotiations, a very, a very complicated uh, matter. And, and how much, of, uh, how, how, would you, how would you direct resources to that when, you were, when there were investment resources? It's not, you know, private investment resources. It's not, uh, it's not clear to me. So, and, and, and the other puzzle that I will give is that, is that we have, the, system, we have the, uh, the, 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 the path of development of resources for sustainable development. And sustainable development includes climate somehow. It's in, that, it's in the package. But then climate is a separate track. And, and how, we re, how, we re, how that is resolved in the, in the kind of international financial and, and, and investment system in a way that's that's, that's most constructive. I, I just leave it as a puzzle. I leave this meeting with that puzzle in my head, th th how to think more clearly about what might be done within the international system to avoid a lot of waste and confusion. Because I think there's going to be, at least it, I, I observe in, the, in, the, in, in a lot of the developed countries, certainly in, in my country, there's a lot of pressure to, uh, against financing dams financing fossil fuels, financing pipelines, things that are going to be needed for, for economic development. And how that's going to play in this system, I think, is, is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm much more aware of some of, the, some of the tensions that we're all going to have to deal with. Doug, did you have a final word? Oh, good. Th thank you very much to our panelists. That was excellent.